Welcome to the 700 Club Canada, and thank you for joining us. Today we focus on Israel. I always love it when we get to go to Israel. Mm -hmm. We have interesting stories on recent archaeological discoveries and a new story that will take us to the Golan Heights. Brian, why should we be interested in the Golan Heights? Well, that's the place where we hear so much in our news uh, reel about uh, the Syrian border yeah. and where all of the fighting has been going on. Right, right. But in, historically, we also recognize that that's the place where mm. Og, king of Bashan, was mm. from as well. Okay. And he was, and if you remember, I think it's the 136th Psalm, and you'll, you'll hear in, in numbers in different places, mm. he was a giant. Right. So he came from the Rephidium. He, mm. he came from the giant, the line of giants. Mm. So it's interesting. And we're yeah. having a giant dispute happening there right now. But there was also giants that in lived the land in the land. At one time. Yes, yeah. at one time. Yeah, it is something. Having been there and stood and looked out, you know, you yes. can see four miles and you yes. can see all the borders right in front of yes. your eyes. Yeah. Yes, and, and that's a lot of what the conflict is and where most people are looking at it now. That's and we also have a story that explores the inside of Herod's Palace, a place where there are 2,000 years of recorded history. And for years, tourists have flocked to an ancient room that may or may not be the location of Jesus' Last Supper. Mm -hmm. Learn how modern technology is giving archaeologists more insight into more history of the room. It's an interesting story. It really is. Watch. The Bible tells us Jesus had a final Passover meal with his disciples before going to the cross. The Cenacolum on Mount Zion is the traditional site, but is this where it really happened? Christian pilgrims from all over the world come here to the Upper Room to remember the Last Supper of Jesus Christ. Now Israeli archaeologists know more about this site than ever before. The Last Supper Room, which is in the, in the middle, in the core of Mount Zion, is one of the most holy places in Jerusalem. It is out of reach to archaeologists because it's sacredness. We couldn't conduct you clear and classical archaeological excavation. So they turned to state-of-the-art technology to uncover the upper room secrets. Using ground penetrating radar, laser measurement, laser scanning, and an advanced photography technique, we managed to reach every corner of the last supper room. We managed to create an accurate 3D model of the place. We even managed to penetrate inside the ancient stones. For years, many wondered, when was the room built and is it the real place? Suddenly, we needed to decipher signs and symbols from the wall. Suddenly, we managed to date it and this wonderful structure is dating to the Crusader period. Archaeologist Amit Ra'em said they discovered two biblical symbols never before seen in the upper room. Now I'm pointing toward the keystone of the Gothic arches. And on the keystone, where nobody saw before, you could see the Holy Lamb, the Agnus Dei. And the Holy Lamb is holding a flag, the victorious flag. Jesus holds the victory flag. On another keystone, there's a lion. You could see the leg and the head is a little bit broken. The lion actually is a symbol of King David. Now we know according to the Bible that Jesus is a descendant of the Davidic dynasty. Underneath the 12th century Crusader church, there's evidence of a magnificent 4th century Byzantine church. This church possessed many, many relics. According to the traditions and the story, the crown of thorns was here. And maybe the Byzantine built their church on much earlier and ancient sacred site. For many, visiting the upper room is a moving experience. But when you told me about the new technology, it moved this place, in my estimation, from a possible to a probable. Surprising and exciting. It's fantastic. It's like this place has the power of the presence. Is like a different note on the scale of the song of God. Being in Israel during this season and then being in places like the upper room just make a huge difference in my faith. Re'em says it's too early to know if this is the place Jesus had his last supper with his disciples. 
But he said he's learned one thing as an archaeologist about traditions. The tradition regarding the Last Supper room is very, very old. It's go back for centuries. Hear this ancient tradition, explore them, because inside them is embedded, is hidden some truth. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, The Upper Room, Jerusalem. You know, it's truly amazing what technology is uncovering. When I recently visited this very site, it was actually one of the most moving sites that I saw when I was in Israel. I walked into this room, this place where perhaps was the last supper of Jesus with his disciples, and there was people everywhere praying in small groups and singing hymns and and just worshiping God. It was like entering into heaven because there was multiple languages and voices and it was just so powerful. Let me take you back to that place because here's how the scripture tells the story. Matthew 26, 26 to 30 reads like this. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he gi had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new within my father's kingdom. When they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I could hear their voices singing. I could see the worship service playing out as Jesus is really saying to his disciples through the bread and the wine, remember me, remember my death, remember my shed blood, remember my broken body. It's for you. And I say that to you today, Jesus died for you. So you and I could receive forgiveness of our sins. Have you said thank you to Jesus? Have you said yes? Well, up next, we'll go inside the walls of the old city to Herod's palace, where some believe Jesus was put to death. At the western edge of the old city, the Tower of David stands above the walls. Sixteen years ago, archaeologists found a building while working on the Tower of David Museum. Records on its walls go back even before the time of Jesus and the Roman governor who sentenced him to the cross, Pontius Pilate. For years, experts suggested that Pilate handed down his death sentence from Antonia's fortress on the other side of the city where the Roman soldiers were housed. But recent evidence uncovered here at the site of King Herod's palace indicates that the luxury-loving Pilate was more likely to have pronounced judgment here. Archaeologist Amit Re'em helped discover the palace site in 1999. He's familiar with the history on these walls from Herod's time until the British put a prison on it in the 1940s. Until now, those impressive walls are the only remains from Herod Palace. We do not know what happened to the superstructures, to the palace itself. Maybe it was destroyed in the big revolt. Maybe it was destroyed by the Romans. Maybe it was destroyed by, by the Crusaders or the Ottoman. We don't know exactly where Jesus uh, was tried, where he had his uh, interview before Pontius Pilate, uh, but we know it's somewhere in Herod's palace. David Pelegi is pastor of Christ Church, just steps away from the site. We know that the palace of Herod the Great eventually became Roman property after Herod's death, and that every year Pontius Pilate would come from Caesarea 
to Jerusalem here during the time of Passover to oversee the security of the city during the festival that the Jews called the Feast of Freedom. And it was at this time where if there was going to be trouble in Jerusalem, it would be uh, during the Pas Passover holiday. Pelegi says that in a way, the Tower of David encompasses the entire life story of Jesus. Scholars have been saying for, for half a century that uh, the life of Jesus begins at the Tower of David or what was then Herod's palace. That's when the Magi come to visit King Herod. And his life ends basically when Pontius Pilate sentences him to death, pretty much in the same location. So there's some very interesting irony in this story. Israeli archeologist Rene Sivan is still struck by its power and opulence, even though she helped begin the digging. Jerusalem is like an onion. You peel it, peel it, peel it, and it never ends. But then you, you cry a bit, but not, not too much. That is what happens here. Pelegi calls the Tower of David the best museum in the city and says tourists would do well to start their journey here. Now we have the extra bonus of uh, having the, the very place where Jesus was sent to execution by Pontius Pilate. And this will help Christians better visualize those uh, monumentous events that happened to uh, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, in the last week of his life. And just a couple of miles away, the Mount of Olives, where scripture says he'll come again. John Wagi, CBN News, Jerusalem. Maranatha, he's coming again. You know, I love as a Bible teacher being able to go into the place where the Word came alive and became flesh. And out of Zion, the Word goes to the rest of the world. You know, it's so beautiful because when you look at uh, Herod's palace and Pontius Pilate governing there and what we're finding out today, and I love what Pastor Pelegi said, and he uh, is at Christ Church. I've stayed at that church and had had tea at that church, and it's just a marvelous place of blending both uh, first century uh, Hebraic Jewish understanding with Christianity. And um, that's the place it started, but that's also the place that Christ not only gave his life for the sins of the world, but we recognize the Mount of Olives, he's coming again. When his feet land on the Mount of Olives, it said it's going to split, and the sword of his mouth, he's going to fight in Armageddon, Tel Megiddo, and that's that via Mars coming in. So, you know, we are at a front row seat of some of the greatest moments in history that are upon us right now. And that's what I love so much about Israel. And if you haven't gone, it is such a wonderful pilgrimage and you need to make a point to do that, put it on your bucket list. But I'm so excited because my heart just, I can only imagine what it'll be like when I see him face to face. And I just, I'm in love with the Savior. And I pray that you find that same love as well. I hope this encourages you looking at all of these segments because it sure encourages me. Up next, meet Israelis living in the Golan Heights. If you enjoy our Hope to Go and Courageous Living segments, then we want to send you this new 30-day devotional called Hope and Courage. We understand that life is full of challenges and questions, and sometimes we have seasons of doubt or need clarity. This devotional is packed with biblical insight and encouragement. It's an easy read, but power packed to fuel your faith and answer some of life's toughest questions. For your generous donation, you'll receive hope and courage. <laughs> it's as easy as calling us at our toll-free number 1-855-759-0700 or visit 700club.ca. Get hope and courage today. And what are we looking at here from this point of view? Oh. So the Sea of Galilee is down, straight down here. Right in front of you, you have the mountains of Tiberias. Right after them, behind them, you have the mountains of Nazareth. And then as you go to the right, to the north, you get to the upper Galilee. And of course, this is where most of the Gospels took place, around the Sea of Galilee. Amitai Ilon owns a holiday village called Natur at the top of the Sea of Galilee on the Golan Heights. Why have you chosen to live here? If you want to live in nature, surrounded by beautiful nature and the sound of birds, you can go to the Golan, Galilee, 
and you can go to the Negev Desert. Now this is a farm. So it's a farm, it's a space that we use for a lot of things. We're sitting right now in a geodesic dome that is a greenhouse. Sometimes it will hold an event, a venue, or a party, or a camping of a big family. It's kind of magical. But as beautiful and peaceful as it is, the borders of Lebanon and Syria run along the Golan Heights. Iran, too, is trying to set up bases on the Syrian side nearby from which to attack Israel. How far are you from the Syrian border? Very close. There's no threat from the other side? Except for 67 war and 73 war, this place has been the safest in the country. Have you grown more apprehensive since Iran has gained a bigger foothold near the Israeli Golan? If you look at the big picture of the history of this place, thousands of years, we had extremely ups and extremely downs, but we're here. Further north, we visited security expert Kobe Marone, who was the former Israeli military commander on the Golan Heights and now lives here. With the unstable situation in Syria, with the Iranian deployment, it's critical for Israel to be here in the Golan Heights and stay here because with so many challenges, I can't think about the situation that we could be on the 67 line. Israel captured the Golan Heights in 1967 during the last two days of the Six-Day War. The Israeli-Syrian border along the Golan is about 55 miles long. Are you under a constant threat here? We feel very safe. The Israeli deterrence is very effective. The Iranian regime had a project. They planned to have here across the border 100,000 Shiites militias with the Hezbollah. They planned to have Air Force bases, Navy bases, intelligence centers. They planned to have an advanced industry to produce a precise missiles that can be a real threat for the center of Israel and the strategic spots of Israel. So that's why we saw in the last three, four years that Israel attacked this Iranian deployment and destroy and we become very successful. Some 50,000 people, more than half Jewish Israelis, live on the Golan Heights. But internationally, it's considered occupied territory. In March 2019, however, President Trump broke with tradition and recognized the strategic heights as part of Israel. Israel named a community in his honor, calling it Trump Heights. It's a dramatic statement. It's, it's unbelievable. It's so important for Positive, sure. A significant declaration because it came from the strongest and the most important Israeli allies, mm -hmm. United States. With the Trump recognition about the Golan Heights, there is a big challenge for the next Israeli government. I think we have to bring 100,000 Israelis to the Golan Heights in the next 10 years. I met Eliyahu Berkowitz in Katsrin, the largest city on the Golan Heights. He immigrated to Israel 28 years ago from New Jersey and moved to the Golan about seven years ago. Are you at all intimidated by the events surrounding Israel and specifically the Golan? I mean, we're always worried about Israel, but there's a lot to be optimistic about. I don't know what people think of the Golan. They built bomb shelters here when they first settled it, and they've never been used. Known in the Bible as Bashan, some 635,000 tourists visited the Golan Heights last year, three-quarters of them Christians, to see its stunning views, historical sites, and wineries. We've always been alone, and when I see Christians interested in Israel, that's something totally new. It gives me incredible optimism. I'm very happy about it. I think I'm helping them to be better Christians, and they're certainly helping me to be a better Jew. What way? Because I want to stay here in Israel, and, and they're helping that. And also, I'm not here just for me. I'm here for the whole world. The Torah was given at Mount Sinai, and we were supposed to be a light unto the nations. If you keep it to yourself, then, then you're breaking it. Elon, who is also a tour guide, summed up Christian commitment to Israel and the Golan Heights. If you came here between 2000 and 2005, we had kind of an intifada happening here. It was empty, except for Christians. Why do you think that is? That is the perspective, that's all. Your connection to the land, is this from the Bible or is it from CNN or from a narrow perspective of few years of troubles? If you're connected by narrow perspective of few years, you would say it's dangerous, it won't come. Do you believe that God is watching over Israel? Absolutely. Do you believe that? The fulfillment of the prophecy is every step you take in the country, it's hard to ignore it. Scott Ross for CBN on the Golan Heights, Israel.
Boy, I love that statement. It's like peeling an onion, and you just keep getting more and more and more out of it. That is so accurate. Yeah, it is accurate, and having been to the Golan Heights and yes. seen those views from afar and yes. thinking of all that's taken place there, yeah. I mean, it's really kind of mind-boggling. It is. But, but I, I did... Uh, you know, there was always a little bit of, you know, uncertainty going to Israel, but when yeah. you get there, you realize it's so secure, it's so safe, the peace is there, yes. and the people are enjoying the land that God has given them. I was so excited when you went your first time, and I asked you, I said, I'm going to ask you when you get back, and I've asked mm -hmm. you before, yeah. but there's one word that would describe when you had your feet yeah. on the ground. What was it? Peace. See, I didn't tell you. No, I know, but you it, didn't, it, it but was, it's true. It, it's shalom. Yes, it is. You're right, and, and the Golan Heights is one of the safest places. You heard yeah. that yeah. outside of the wars that they had there before and it being on the Syrian border. I mean, they haven't had really any conflict, and it's been a very safe space. Yeah, it really was. I mean, there was lots of people there from all over the world that were enjoying not only the views, but just reminded of the history and the, really the presence of God in protecting his people, too. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things that I appreciate most as well is because it's an ancient city, and, you know, we, we hear about all the history that's taken place, but it really has a lot of modern things, you yeah. know, in the in the in the malls, the places that you go, Definitely. and you know, to eat in the restaurants. Yeah. So it's it's really a a, a bit of a conundrum. Mm -hmm. It is, and but as you go up into the hills there, though, you see a more uh, more simple way of living. Yeah, it, it transports you. doesn't It, it? does, and the agriculture yes. everywhere. And so, I mean, I'm a country girl at heart. Yeah. So that's where I felt most at home. Yeah. <laughs> I and, love it. And, and and so often we think. Yeah. That it's just all desert, but it, yeah. the, the desert's yeah. blooming. Yeah, absolutely. You gotta go. Up next, apologist Nathan Betts looks at some of your biggest questions surrounding the Bible. Mm -hmm. He founded one of the world's largest television ministries, established a leading university, and became a New York Times best-selling author. Now, Pat Robertson wants to share with you significant insights learned from a lifetime in the Word of God. In his latest book, 10 Laws for Success, Keys to Win in Work, Family and Finance, call now to receive 10 Laws for Success. I would like to become a Christian, but why so many rules? When we discuss rules, I think a good starting point is to just think, well, first, why are there rules in the first place? Now, just think about rules in sport or at home or in society. Why are they there? Why were the rules put there in the first place? Now, I love sports, so let's just think about sport for a second. I love the game of baseball. And recently, there was a rule put in place in baseball that basically said the catcher can no longer block home plate. When a runner, a base runner is coming from third base to home plate, the catcher cannot block the home plate. Instead, they need to actually provide a clear pathway so the runner can actually see home plate, he can touch it without being sort of blocked by the catcher. With that being said, the catcher can still uh, tag that runner out if he, if he has the ball in hand. Now here's the thing, why was that rule put in place? The rule was put in place because there have been so many injuries related to catchers being barreled over by runners going at full speed to home plate. Why? Because the catcher was there blocking home plate. And injuries, like lethal injuries, like players just not being able to play the game anymore. Uh, catchers having broken knees, broken ankles because the catcher was there blocking home plate. So why was the rule put in place? The rule was put in place to protect these athletes to protect the catcher from being injured. Similarly, when we think about rules in Christianity, if you look at the scriptures, when God actually puts rules in place, when Christ talks about different rules, the rules are similar in that they're put for our protection, for our well-being, to enable us to flourish, to live well. But there's also a difference. The difference is that in Christianity, the rules are given within a framework of relationship. The starting point for rules in Christianity is love. God loves us. And from Old Testament to New Testament, we see that God is saying, look, I love you. Here are rules that are going to enable you to live well, to flourish in life. They will protect you. 
They're not, the rules are not put in place to withhold pleasure or enjoyment. They're put in place for us to live well, to do well. The starting point for these rules that God puts in place is love. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Israel is the most in place, important place on the planet because that's exactly where Christ is coming back again. We hear about the conflict, and it's so important for us to make sure that we keep calibrated with what God is doing in Israel. That's so true, Brian, and going there now, I have a greater appreciation for understanding not only did Jesus come there, he's coming again there. Amen. And, and of course, the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus came for every person, yes. for all nations. This was actually shocking to the Jewish people, yes. that God's love of forgiveness, right, would actually be on, extend beyond them. Yes. But you see it when you go to Israel. You see every nation there. It's just a beautiful picture of God's family. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know... That's why we're here, to make sure that we take you there, because we believe that everyone is going to hear and know when Jesus comes back again. And with technology, we have that opportunity, but we need your partnership. We need your help to continue to spread this message. And for just $20 a month or your best gift, we would love to get into your hands the 10 laws of success. And it's really the principles of what the Word of God says, how to lead a very successful and a productive biblical life. And uh, if you call now, it would be such an encouragement. one 855 700 Prayer partners are standing by. And some of our partners have called Brian or sent messages over the internet, which yes. is 700club.ca. You can send your messages there. Thank you, says Lisa, for all your prayers for my family over the past few years. I greatly appreciate this ministry. Thank you, Lisa. That Thank you, Lisa. A lot. And Justin, he says, I love how your ministry helps me through life circumstances and leads me to God. Well, there's the bump, Justin. Yeah, that's Way it, Justin. Go. Thank you. You know, Genesis 26, 4 says this, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offsprings, all the nations on earth will be blessed. That is the promise of the gospel, isn't it? It is. A God who loves all people. So the invitation's for you too. Make sure you receive it. Thanks for watching. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram.